So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome today's first speaker, Matt Hemmeyer, SVP with Ipsos's User Experience Practice. Matt, you have the floor. Hello. Thanks for the uh, the nice intro there, Ellen. Um, I'm delighted to be here and wanted to uh, thank everybody for taking the time to listen to our conversation about design principles for emerging technology. Uh, before we launch into that, a quick introduction so you guys know who you're you're listening to here. Um, as Ellen mentioned, I'm Matt Hemmeyer. I'm a senior vice president on the Ipsos UX team, and I get to lead the team of UX research and design consultants who deliver work to our largest uh, enterprise tech clients. Our team loves deeply complex technical subject matter um, and the confluence of all of these various technologies that will enable next gen experiences are exciting and fun for us to study and design and generally think about. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Pip and Caitlin to introduce themselves. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm Caitlin Hall, previously Falls. I am a director of UX here at Ipsos UX, and I lead the Extended Reality Initiative within Ipsos UX. Specifically, I focus on evaluating the consumer-facing experiences, so thinking about how your front-end consumer or user may experience uh, extended reality hardware or software. Um, so it's great to be here to um, speak with you all. Uh, and hey, I'm uh, Pip Mothersill, uh, also a director in the UX team here in North America. Um, originally from the UK, I have experience in both industry and academia, um, most recently at the MIT Media Lab. And what I do, if Caitlin talked about looking into the front end, I think about the back end, really unpacking all of those uh, messy ecosystems where we have all of these devices that want to um, communicate with each other that will contribute to this vision for this seamless metaverse. Um, so that's something that, that I work on, trying to understand how that can be a really seamless transition and experience. Man, there is a lot of talk about the metaverse right now, isn't there? Um, and it, it, well, it seems like we're hearing from clients every day, um, asking getting questions about the metaverse. There's just so much buzz about it. The data actually backs that up. Um, it doesn't just feel like that. Uh, in a recent survey, uh, it turns out that over 50% of adults across 29 different countries um, say they're familiar with the metaverse and they widely expect it to have a huge impact on their lives uh, in the next decade. The vision of the metaverse or what people currently understand it to be is relatively simplistic though. It's, it's you know, basically Beat Saber or connecting with, with friends to chat in VR. The, the real metaverse, the promise of it is, it's so much more than that though. Um, when we think about how a confluence of various networking technologies came together as the web and engendered a whole new generation of experiences, um, we're still waiting for a similar confluence with, um, with the technologies that will eventually be the metaverse. I mean, the real truth of this is that the various technologies like extended reality hardware will come together with Web3 or crypto powered um, transfers of, of value across different types of, of domains. AIML will deeply understand your context and serve up dynamic content. And this will all be sort of continuously interconnected, um, bringing physical and, and digital worlds together. And I realize that that's a lot of abstract technical jargon um, that's probably really hard to imagine what that full promise, the, the sort of capital M metaverse could look like. And so I want to ask Caitlin to walk us through a really fully realized um, example of what really could mean for us on a day-to-day -day life um, and what a fully realized metaverse experience might look like. All right, so I'd like you all to imagine that we're 20 years into the future. Uh, now we can experience what a true metaverse might feel like. 
So first you need to imagine that you have uh, extended reality contacts in your eyes, as well as they're synced to your uh, earbuds, which have a voice assistant connected to them. Let's imagine that in, the, in this future, you're walking around a city street. Um, maybe you're in between meetings and it's a little chillier than you imagined. So you wanna grab a sweater before you go into the next call. Uh, you hop out onto the, onto the sidewalk and you tell your virtual assistant, uh, pull up the nearest store to me so I can grab a cardigan. Uh, she syncs with your contacts and suddenly the vision uh, in front of you, the straight blurs a little bit so you can see the uh, different options you have available to you. Uh, she pulls up uh, different clothing boutiques, different distances, and you notice that there's one that's 30 blocks away by foot. You select that one and she lets you know that you can travel there by bike to save some time or there's a, a deal right now. You can say taxi and in two minutes the taxi will directly come to your location because she's already geolocated where you are for you. You do decide to take up the deal, so you yell taxi and you're quickly in a store looking at sweaters. While you're in the store, as soon as you step through the door, uh, you have a virtual storefront ahead of you that overlays to the store as you're looking at different clothing. Here you can pick up different clothes and it'll immediately sync with what you're seeing in front of you to let you know what the price is, uh, what the size is, and giving you different options and deals. You pick up a sweater and in front of you, you have different options that pull up onto your vision. You can see your digital closet so that you can view how the sweater looks with other clothes that you already own. You can also look at other items in the store that might go nicely with the sweater that you've chosen. You can decide to purchase the sweater right then and there. Uh, and just by syncing it to your crypto wallet or your digital phone pay. And then you can walk out of the store without even uh, stopping to talk to any, any store folks. You can even try it on um, right then without uh, having to go into the fitting room, do a virtual mirror. Uh, you notice that there is an option to have a personal uh, assistant uh, style you so that you can make sure that it looks good with any outfit you'd like. You decide you're just going to pick up the sweater, uh, purchase for it right then with a really quick press of the button and you walk out the store and you're back on your way to your next meeting. Thanks, Caitlin. It's gonna be awesome. Like that is really an amazing um, advance for, for our society and the way to use technology the challenge is that we're nowhere close, right? The capital M metaverse doesn't exist. Um, so where are we? Let's take a step back and think about what the reality is right now. There are immersive virtual worlds right now. Um, unfortunately, they're all connected or all disconnected. And so anything that you buy or build in one of those worlds is difficult to take with you to other worlds. There's no real transfer of value. And in fact, you may have to use different devices to access the, the different worlds. Um, and most of those worlds are quite limited. Um, there is no one dominant uh, immersive virtual world that, that really allows for a huge variety of, of different types of, of experiences. Um, also, the Web3 crypto or, or some type of decentralized um, authentication technology is going to be really important for things like authentication, transfer of value, um, establishment of identity, but and they will eventually allow for uh, uh, this persistence. They're totally inefficient. Um, they're a nightmare for regular people to, to access and use. They're um, super, super shady too. Uh, if you've been watching the news at all over the last couple of weeks, you probably know that even larger or seemingly stable players in this space 
um, can be built on very shaky foundations and often sort of disappear overnight. Um, and so while this, the, the Web3 crypto world carries a lot of promise, it is not ready for a mass consumer uh, base at this point. Um, same kind of deal with, with the hardware. VR headsets and smart AR glasses have really come a long way, um, but they still have a long way to go. The reality is that they're, they're big, they're hot, they don't pack a ton of compute power, so they aren't able to run um, super complex operations. And there's a, a societal acceptance element to this too. They're still just really dorky looking. And the idea that people are going to begin wearing uh, headsets in their current form factor out in public on a, a wide scale is just, it's just not happening. And then maybe most importantly is that there isn't any kind of standard standards or, or protocols that would allow for widespread interoperability. The technologies that eventually came together to be the internet existed like, seriously for decades before they all came together. And certainly advances in the technology were important for the, the eventual deployment of the internet, but so were standards boards. I mean, like without the World Wide Web Consortium, without things like the TCP IP protocol, there is no way that we could have had the equal opportunity and the, the openness that allowed creators all over the world to partake in, in the internet uh, on relatively common ground. And there just isn't anything like that for the metaverse yet, certainly nothing that's that universal or, or that formalized. And so that development of standards boards and universal protocols that will really allow for for widespread interoperability is is going to be critical to the the evolution and so knowing all of that we've thought about where we are today and what design principles would be important for building meaningful and valuable experiences in the metaverse as it sort of exists currently. Um, we've been lucky to have a chance to do research on this set of emerging technologies over the last several years. Um, technologies like extended reality, so AR, VR, um, AI or machine learning powered experiences um, that can dynamically serve content or experiences based on a user's context. Um, we've done a lot of work with smart devices and sensors uh, that can help give that signal around context. Um, and as we've gotten more familiar with the space, we've gotten more familiar with the, the variables that lay the foundation for positive um, or really valuable experiences. And so for the duration of the rest of this webinar, we're going to go through those, um, those principles and share some of the ideas that that we have related to um, creating these types of immersive or metaversical experiences. We have six of them to share with you. Um, they're fairly straightforward sounding until you start to think about the complexity afforded by the space. And then there's, there's a lot to unpack. Um, the first is to simply add value. And while that may seem like a kind of master of the obvious statement, it's going to be really important for us to help our clients and our stakeholders avoid investing in gimmicky or really worthwhile experiences. If you think back to the 20 teens when Alexa skills were first sort of widely available, it was like a land rush. And I, I was in consulting at that point and certainly heard from a lot of my clients that they just wanted to be a part of Alexa. They wanted an Alexa skill and they didn't really have any idea why they just wanted to do it. And I think we're already starting to hear from some of our stakeholders or from our clients that they're interested in the same thing related to the metaverse. So guiding them towards experiences that really take advantage of the, the immersive or contextually aware uh, capabilities and avoiding 
things that are perceived as gimmicky or not worthwhile is going to be really important. The next principle is going to be to scale immersion. Um, immersion and this I, I, ability to feel completely embodied in a totally different space or a part of the world where maybe you thought you'd never visit or to feel like you are in the presence of friends or loved ones. It's one of the really powerful um, capabilities that current VR brings to bear. And that's great for, for a, some experiences, but there are different levels of immersion that are applicable for different types of experiences. And so we wanna think carefully about what value the experience is trying to convey, and then what level of immersion is, is appropriate. Um, we were talking with an expert at one point who was talking about augmented reality and they were saying you have to be really thoughtful with the every single pixel that you use in in um, in AR because every pixel that you put in front of somebody's eyes is one pixel of the real world that they're not going to see and the real world is still pretty amazing. So really being thoughtful about the level of immersion uh, we want to get into is is important. We also think it's critical to safeguard users. And yeah, of course it is. But because of the immersive nature of a lot of these experiences, there are so many ways that you can you can put your your users at risk. There is the risk of they're feeling that their personal space is encroached on. There's the risk of collecting data insecurely, and it's very intimate, like incredibly sensitive data that, that's going to be collected. Or there's even physical concerns with moving people into spaces that are unsafe or like physically injuring them during some of the, the potential experiences. And the potential repercussions for brands or for the creators, if they don't safeguard their users, is, is really high. Um, another great promise for this space and something that's, that's incredibly valuable is the ability to detect the context of users and then serve up dynamic content for them based on their context. And so really embracing that ability to contextualize and then making that seamless for the users is super important. The idea of porous boundaries is tough right now because there isn't good interconnectivity between all of the, the immersive worlds, but the idea is the same. If, if someone were to buy a pair of shoes that they could only wear in one shopping mall, they'd never do it, right? And so if you're looking to can transfer something of value to your users, if that's part of the experience, thinking about how they can move that value from one experience to another or take that with them so that they get maximum value from whatever they've built, purchased, won, or experienced is going to be really important. And then the last thing is just be realistic. Be aware of where we are right now with the technology, where the hardware is at, what's really possible, um, and what's possible in a uh, uh, a delivery mechanism that's going to actually be enjoyable. We don't want to stretch the hardware out to where things are laggy or buggy. We want to realize what is likely to um, to make people sick or not. We want to just really be aware of the current lay of the land and create experiences that, that re reflect that um, and deliver on the promise of what's here today and not necessarily the promise of what's going to come next generation. Um, and so with that intro, I'm going to hand it off to, to Caitlin to talk about the first three of these um, and let her get into a lot more detail about what these principles really mean in practice. Thank you, Matt. So the first principle sounds so universal. It's something that comes up again and again when any new technology is being introduced or any new features are being introduced. We always hope that any new design or product or idea adds value to the world. This also remains center and, and one of the most fundamental components to any emerging technology like extended reality as well. And so for this, we recommend uh, ensuring that this is one of the first things you think of when embarking on any design pro project or process um, in this space. We want to ensure that 
the technology that is being developed is introducing both useful and remarkable solutions. And what I mean by that is that it's important to deliver experiences that go beyond imagination. When we are starting to uh, see how immersive and interactive technology um, can provide a new lens of an experience for people, uh, we see that it's possible to build things that are otherwise impossible. So now that uh, the internet and this tech has evolved, uh, we can create stuff that has physics that we don't currently have in the physical real world. Uh, for example, on the left uh, is an NFT designed and created by an artist, Andre Reisinger, um, which shows a piece of furniture that couldn't exist in our world today. But when shown in a virtual world with different virtual uh, physical uh, components, uh, built from algorithms and uh, representing different types of fabrics and physical engines, uh, you can see it, it creates a very dynamic and interesting way to experience and appreciate art. Uh, applying those kind of fantastical experiences for people to enjoy it can be one of the very cool strengths of of extended reality, including virtual reality or augmented reality. Now we can overlay a digital experience into someone's world that makes something that's otherwise impossible. So on the right here, you can see a meeting on the moon, which is uh, an example of a Microsoft and Frame VR collaboration where they built out what it might feel like for people to be on the moon and, and even jump with moon physics or toss a basketball um, and even learn about it as they go. Um, since this is a meeting space, uh, you can even host a classroom where you're teaching students about um, different properties of the moon. And this time, instead of just learning about it, they can also try it firsthand um, through that simulated experience. That creativity, which breeds innovation and, and creates that additional um, contextualization can really help make experiences feel more real to people. And, and it offers a new way to appreciate the world around us and, and what we learn. However, we also uh, recommend, of course, pushing beyond novelty, um, as Matt said, any feature or product um, that is super, super cool um, that, that novelty only lasts for so long. It's important to ground those remarkable experiences in some added value to the user and, and to the consumer so that people can see the beyond the magic and how it can apply to, to help to their real life, to, to help them achieve the goal that they have or, or motivate them to, to continue to come back to that experience, to explore and learn more and, and continue to add value to their life. So there are some different examples here of, of potential features or, or ways that this type of extended reality is being applied now, um, where novelty factor is of course still here, um, but it goes beyond that as well. So on the left is an example of using a combined mixed reality program so that students can learn how the carbon, how a carbon physical a piece of carbon can zoom in to become a molecule so they can understand the molecular components that actually build that physical structure, um, which is a new way for them to learn. Other ways that this could be applied is providing you in context uh, navigation. So if you're traveling in Paris, you can immediately pull up directions and see exactly um, in front of your face, um, where you need to go with that big arrow. And additionally, um, if you are interested to learn something new, perhaps you could attend a virtual meetup um, from your home with people around the world to learn how to do sign language or even to attend events or entertainment that otherwise would not be available to you. Or even just having fun and, and getting a some fitness and breaking a sweat while moving around in an immersive virtual game. 
each of these um, kind of push beyond that excitement and change of altering the physical world with digital by also providing some uh, steps for the user to apply to their life so they can make things more efficient or, or get some exercise in really quickly uh, without going to the gym. In addition to um, adding some value with these types of designs, um, it's important, as Matt mentioned, to ensure that we embrace the multidimensional levels that extended reality can provide um, so that we consider how are people going to use the digital uh, interactions and physical um, so that they can get the most out of that experience. Uh, but that actually starts from the design first. Um, is the experience that you want people to have going to make sense uh, for how they're going to use it? And so for this, we encourage to scale the immersion and consider how uh, embodied or how interactive it needs to be for it to really sing. But before I go delve too far into this principle, allow me to give you um, an introduction to what I really mean by immersion. Um, so with uh, the introduction of this immersive internet, um, you can have people explore and interact with digital information in new ways. Not only can they view something on a 2D screen um, and, and scroll through their phone um, to see things, but also they can build it all around them and have a sense of physical space with the digital that they're looking at. So for example, you can uh, suddenly be transported to a new place so that when you look around you, um, you're no longer in your home, but perhaps you're in a totally new area of the world, learning about uh, a landmark perhaps. And this time you feel as if you're truly there, even if you've never stood up. You can also interact with digital objects. So you can uh, pick things up and move them around, um, see a 3D model perhaps of, of a home or a, a car that you might be personalizing, and you can walk around it and, and pick it up and move it, make it larger, smaller. Um, instead of only looking at a digital image, now you can truly play with it, move it around, see the that extra nature of it. And then in addition, another way that this may um, develop is that you could even interact with digital things and digital people. So just like now, when you're um, on Reddit, you can uh, comment to people, respond to threads, um, read and have discussions. Now um, it's not only uh, graduated to that 2D Zoom meeting where we can see each other's um, faces, but you can feel that presence of someone sitting next to you because in a virtual place um, with virtual people, you can feel that they're really there alongside of you. Um, and with the in introduction of new technology, someday it may be possible to even shake their hand or give them a high five um, so that it feels even more like you're right next to them, even if you're thousands of miles apart. So there's lots of potential capabilities for adding these layers of immersion. But building an experience to leverage those levels is important. Not every experience is going to need you to be able to high five a, a shopkeeper while you're shopping in their store uh, virtually. However, uh, you might have different reasons to build in these layers. So for example, um, on the left of the screen here, we have uh, what an augmented reality experience could look like, which is a lower level of immersion. It can be accessed on your phone, and you can have people interact with the object to see how it looks in their physical real home. Uh, some experiences might uh, be better suited for uh, something like this, where someone can very quickly pull up something on their phone or a computer, um, as long as they have a camera, to see how that digital overlay looks like in real life. However, the more we build up these immersive capabilities, the more different and dynamic things that someone could do. And so, for example, in the middle, we have here um, an example of what it looks like to have a mixed reality, 
where a 3D model of a human um, uh, heart system um, and valves um, can be easily shown and demonstrated to students who are preparing or learning about how to conduct a transplant. Um, in this model, everyone can see the same structure from the different perspectives that they have around the room. In addition, somebody who might remotely be attending a meeting to learn about this can see the same thing that the people in the physical room are seeing because they can attend from anywhere they are and still see that 3D object. Um, going up the chain here, we go into a fuller, more um, immersive layer as well. Not only can you walk around and interact with the objects more like you could in, in mixed reality, but in virtual reality, you are fully feeling as if you're in a new place. Right now, as virtual reality shows, um, you can kind of cover your entire vision with the digital world and feel uh, more removed from the physical world around you. This can offer opportunities to feel as if you're transported to a new place, um, perhaps even going somewhere you've never been before to play mini golf and, and meet up with people, friends or family, um, or even someone new um, to walk the mini golf course with them um, while you haven't even left your home, but you can still have a good round of golf or just conversation with the others around you. And in the future, perhaps another layer that could be added is um, a feeling element where someone could pick up something and feel the weight of it before they make that purchase or strum the guitar strings as they're learning how to play guitar through a virtual class, things like that. These offer different ways to think about how we design uh, features um, pending how the person is going to be using it. An optimal experience may allow different dimensions of embodiment, like as we just discussed, but not everything is going to require everything. So uh, some experiences might be better suited when you're on the go. If somebody is traveling, for example, having a way to very quickly pull up some augmented directions, um, either on their classes or through a laptop or a tablet or a phone, something that's easy to transport, can become very important. You don't want to be um, wearing a VR headset while you're taking a flight in between countries or, or walking down the street. That could be dangerous. Um, but you can still access digital technology and, and get that enhancement and assistance from wherever you are. A mixed immersion experience might be most helpful when you are collaborating with others. So thinking about um, how a design might be best suited for group work um, collaboration, especially when teams are not all in the same place and they're scattered across the globe. Um, a mixed reality experience can allow people to still see the world around them so they can talk to coworkers or colleagues um, who are in the same room as them. But it also allows somebody who is in an office a few thousand miles away to port themselves into that meeting space and feel as if they're all there together while they're working on a, a project. Um, this is also helpful in um, scenarios where someone is working with physical objects but wants to have that um, digital interaction and, and overlay to get assistance while they're working with potentially highly uh, technical uh, and uh, highly technical things. Um, where uh, it would be dangerous if they're fully removed from it because it is important that they can physically play something without injuring themselves. And a fully immersive experience may be helpful when uh, you want someone to feel completely transported into that new world. Um, perhaps if someone is going to plan out a trip, for example, um, being able to kind of go there ahead of time and plot out the different places that are going to be important for them to, to take their friends and family to, this can help them make that plan and, and feel like they're really there before they've physically spent the money to take the, the trip. Um, or perhaps for gaming or, or meeting with other people when you are not meeting in a public place, but you're in the privacy of your own home. Attend a virtual concert, for example, um, because perhaps um, you are sick, but you still want to have the experience of, of being um, at the event. 
these experiences could also be layered. So instead of optimizing for only one, um, potentially at some point, there will be an ability to layer these experiences um, so that they translate across these different levels simultaneously. For example, today, um, when we access the internet, we can do so from our phone, we can switch over to our laptop or a PC, we can even use a tablet or our TV. Um, all of these different apps have now been more optimized so that we can switch between devices and, and use them in different contexts. Eventually, it will be important that we can do this with um, some immersive experiences as well. So not only developing or creating an experience that matches only augmented reality, but perhaps adding an opportunity to layer it up to different immersion levels, pending the context of where the user is or what device they might be accessing the experience with. On the left here, you can see an example of Snap AR's kit for virtual shopping. This is currently a, a great way for people to try on different types of clothes like shoes perhaps, or, or a hat, or makeup, or um, a coat even. Um, and they can try it on anywhere they are just from using their phone. Um, however, another example of this type of shopping is using it for VR. And so here we have an example of what was a pop-up that Amazon did of a VR dressing room where someone could uh, just hop into VR and try on different clothes that are going to be sold at Amazon um, and launch during uh, perhaps a holiday event. Um, they can try on clothes in different ways depending on where they are and get a different experience. In the virtual reality one, you can get a sense of how it would feel to wear that clothes. Um, and perhaps you do that when you're at home rather than out and about with the phone. As we've discussed, safety is so important as well. Um, and that goes for really any experience nowadays that's connected to the online world. And so it, it is all the same when we are continuing to add these extra layers of uh, spatial digital experiences. So we need to ensure that each system is secure for the well-being of the people using it and also for their privacy, since so much more data is being collected when people are having that more physical experience too. We need to design safe, secure, and comfortable experiences. And so it's important that we think anyway, that we think about three ways to approach that. Um, because now we're combining physical with digital, we now need to also ensure that people are physically safe when they're accessing that more digital world or that digital world that's now connected to our physical space. So ensuring that when someone's walking around they, with a, that additional layer um, of AR on their face, like, like Matt mentioned, um, you don't want to block out their vision so much that they could injure themselves. In addition, um, it's important that we think about how do we protect people's mental well-being and health when they're accessing these experiences, particularly if it's a public experience um, or if it's an experience that brings people back to it again and again? How do we ensure that they um, are feeling safe and secure and, and mentally well and supported in the experiences they have? And then when we're thinking about um, new ways that this technology integrates into our life, how do we secure that digital information that is being collected? I'm gonna go into a little detail about each of these in these next slides. So when it comes to physical safety, designing persistent guidelines and reminders to promote people's physical safety as they're using any device. In virtual reality, where you're completely blocked off from the physical world at this point, um, giving people a boundary to make sure that they know how to clear their area so that they don't injure themselves, knock their knees, trip over things is incredibly important. Uh, this goes the same for mixed reality or augmented reality as well. Um, you want to make sure that there are some reminders in there that people aren't um, maybe looking down at their phone or, or so distracted by the digital information that they see that they uh, trip or fall into a pothole, perhaps, when they're walking down the street. 
Um, so building in systems that can alert users of potential hazards so that they aren't missing, the, that the physical world is still existing around them when they're using these technologies. Um, or warnings and, and safety instructions for the best type of person to use a device so that they don't get ill or, or impede any developmental stages um, for children, for example. Um, and if there is likelihood of, of getting motion sick or, or nausea, disorientation, vertigo from using a device, um, it's very important to build in ways for users to um, both see how comfortable they are and also um, protect them by allowing them very clear instructions on how to get out of an experience if um, it's not going well for them uh, physically. In addition to physical, um, we need to think about how that translates when you are physically being uh, represented in a digital way as well. Um, for example, uh, allowing personal boundaries. Um, if we're going to be suddenly um, in virtual chat rooms where we feel like we're truly there with other people, um, it's just like the real world, but digital. We want to make sure that um, if we're in a public space, uh, people aren't knocking into us or um, touching us in ways that are uncomfortable. And that goes the same way for a digital experience too. Uh, when we are uh, seeing digital information, especially um, when it's so close to our, our vision, our brain perceives it um, as reality. So if somebody comes up to you um, and, and starts to get into your whole space um, in virtual reality, for example, that's still going to be extremely uncomfortable. So building in ways for the user to control and set down um, perhaps personal bubbles or, or creating boundaries or guidelines um, that users should follow so that everyone feels safe in interactions with each other is paramount, especially if we are going to have um, public places for people to visit, such as a virtual shopping mall. Um, you want to make sure that when you're having your shopping experience, um, you're not suddenly barraged with um, harassment or, or yelling or screaming um, in that space. So having a system that is already designed to um, help people not only um, feel safe, but also have moderators or a moderating type of uh, option to help people ensure that they feel comfortable throughout all of the experiences that they're having with others online. And lastly, but not least importantly in this section, of course, um, is that now with this uh, type of technology, more data could be collected. Um, and this is something that people are already sensitive about now um, when they are accessing different websites and uh, going to different applications. With the uh, potential for this type of technology to scan our faces or our environments, um, that type of data is, can be considered very private and personal for any user. So ensuring that people are feeling um, that their data is not going to be um, taken or, or used um, in ways that are nefarious, um, and making sure that they feel that it's going to be um, responsibly and securely protected um, if they are using uh, some additional tracking when they are accessing a feature. This, this is very important so that people don't feel as if their identity could be taken or, or they could be located from uh, potentially a hacker or a, a user who has poor intentions. Other ways to think about it is maybe to even not store the data at all and to instead uh, temporarily collect it so that uh, people know that when they go on to experience anything that is collected is really just going to be anonymized and discarded um, after they leave. Um, there's lots of different ways to think about this and uh, there's more exploring to be done for sure, but users are savvy and, and know about this um, as a potential option. And so while they might be additionally um, more interested in some ways to have a cool new experience, eventually that trade-off is going to be wanting that uh, more secure feeling experience as well. Now I'm going to hand it over to Pip to go over the next few slides with you all. Hi, thanks, Caitlin. 
Um, great. So, yes. Yeah, so our next principle is to, um, as we said, think about how we can customize these experiences so that the user gets exactly the type of experience that they want. Um, and ideally, we want to be able to contextualize this automatically. These new VR and XR devices have an incredible array of sensors, such as cameras that track our hands and our bodies. They can scan the environment around us. They'll soon be tracking our eyeballs, our body temperature, possibly even our brain waves. Um, when you're designing these future experiences, this is an opportunity to take advantage of this sensor data to give those users a really customized experience that's relevant to their immediate needs and not add pixels where we don't need them, as Matt said. Um, and so this is where we need to start with a basic, you know, UX research tenant with considering the context of the user. Much like designing responsive mobile web UX and a UI, in metaverse experiences, um, there's some other factors that we need to consider to make um, a more responsive, contextually relevant experience. So the first one is thinking about how the physical space um, affects um, the experience. As Caitlin described earlier, there are different levels of immersion that you can experience in the metaverse, some of which take account of the physical space um, of the user more than others. Um, you may have experienced um, with augmented reality apps on your phone where virtual content is overlaid on top of the physical world around you. This is one of the incredible benefits of augmented reality being able to seamlessly blend these physical and virtual worlds, but it requires scanning of all of the surfaces around the user and finding the right, right one to place the virtual object on top of, like a vase on top of a coffee table. Um, you know, it then also just needs to adjust the position and the scale and even the lighting conditions so it makes sense for that user's experience. Otherwise, it's just not going to feel like it's a blended natural part of the experience and just feel a bit gimmicky. Um, this mapping is less important for the fully immersive virtual experiences, but as Matt said, the one thing to think about is how comfortable are people going to feel wearing that headset? Um, you know, they might feel differently about wearing it in a private space versus in a public space where they're around strangers or feel um, more or less safe to have a um, dynamic moving um, experience um, versus just having an experience where they can sit still. Um, so that's just something to consider as well. Um, from the social point of view, another thing to consider is um, what um, different social situations your user is going to be in. For example, what sort of avatar um, are they going to want to use in a work situation versus a social situation? And how can that change um, automatically? Um, how does the virtual environment change when the user is in different contexts? Um, you know, for example, if they're playing a game um, and they want to interact with other people, it may have a different environment than when someone is working by themselves. For example, in the desktop VR app you see at the bottom, there's the ability to set up dozens of different screens around you in a virtual environment, which may work great for one person, but may not um, be a good in, um, experience if multiple people want to try and use those screens. When you do think about when you want to have these more interactive um, experiences, um, then you maybe need to set up something which is more like the real world, like in Horizon workrooms there, where you can see everyone just sitting around a conference table. That environment affords um, this um, virtual um, uh, interaction between different people much better than, than other environments. So that's something to think about. And then the last thing, context to think about is um, how the experience can be customized for different technical capabilities. Um, that's not dissimilar to how we consider designing for different mobile device OSs today. Um, because we want these experiences to be used by as many people as possible, one thing to think about is how your immersive um, experience can be accessed on different devices, for example, on a laptop, as well as an augmented reality app on your phone, or even um, or a virtual reality headset. Also, how can it be accessed by different brands? We, um, you know, as Matt said, there are many different um, uh, different device ecosystems. Um, you you want to be able to have as many people using it, um, not just dedicated to one particular device. Steam VR is actually a great example of a platform that is brand agnostic. It allows users to play and download and play games on a wide range of device types and manufacturers. 
Another thing to think about when it comes to the technology and just enabling your users to have these um, immersive experiences is thinking about the amount of bandwidth that your user will have. These immersive experiences can be very bandwidth heavy, requiring really good Wi-Fi connection, um, which could limit the number of users that you have or also the locations um, in which they can access your experience. So one thing to consider is how your experience can have a lighter version of it so that users can still experience it when they're on the go or accessing it from a lower end device. Second Life is actually a great example of this as it senses and then modifies the user's um, technology or network capabilities and then allows their user to continue to engage with um, the content, but at the, the level of fidelity um, that their bandwidth or their device can handle. Um, but it's not enough for to design for these experiences separately, all these contexts separately. Um, as Matt said, the, the ideal metaverse experience is this really um, automatically contextually aware experience where um, a user can, um, has, can move from a public to a private space. They can move from using a full VR headset to an AR device. They can move from a high to a low bandwidth um, connection connectivity um, and the experience um, will update itself um, automatically um, and by doing this that's the way that the user can really feel like that immersive connected experience that this ideal metaverse vision is um, never disrupted. Um, however as Caitlin was saying we have to safeguard users um, as you may um, uh, realize, in order to make all of these seamlessly context-aware experiences work, we need to collect camera data from the user's environment, their location data, their movement data, even their biometric data. This is um, far much more sensitive data than we're currently connecting, and it's far more of it. And so the potential for misuse um, in the future is, is a real issue. Um, and so as Caitlin said, um, we just need to be considerate about the context um, and the content um, when, when we're um, collecting the data. Only collect data that is important in that particular moment. Um, you know, users, again, as they, they're savvy, they know that they need to hand over data, um, but they just, there's just a trade-off. And overall, they just want clear communication about what data is being collected um, and how it is used so that they can feel a little bit more in control. Um, and, you know, as Caitlin said as well, um, you know, one option is to not collect it at all. Um, and Apple devices are a great example of this where they can store the data locally on the device or use edge computing um, or advanced machine learning techniques such as federated learning to analyze it without compromising a user's personal identity. So this next principle is about creating porous boundaries. Um, and that's because everything, even digital things and interactions are more valuable if you can take them many places with you. Um, Matt's and, uh, and Caitlin's analogies about, you know, not having to just wear one pair of shoes in, in one single shopping mall um, is, is great. That's what we have at the minute, um, but that's not the, the ideal. You know, we have, so many different um, device ecosystems to contend with at the minute as this field emerges. We have phones, laptops, tablets, AR devices, extended reality devices, VR devices. We have all of these devices are made by different brands. So Microsoft, Magic Leap, Meta, um, uh, Vive, there will be an Apple one coming out at some point. There are so many of these different individual worlds that we go to, Roblox, Horizon, Minecraft, Decentraland. And we are collecting an increasing amount of digital stuff, such as Bitcoin and um, furniture and avatars and clothing um, that we're going to want to, to take with us across these different experiences. Um, so we're going to want to be able to um, keep the user feeling as immersed as possible. 
Um, and we want to do that by seamlessly transferring between these ecosystems. So for devices, it means thinking about, you know, the different types of devices and immersive experiences that your whole range of users might um, experience or the different devices that one user might have in themselves and being able to translate that experience to be um, across those different devices so that, you know, on the go, you can experience it on your phone. Back at home, you can experience um, a more richer version of that on a VR headset. Um, then also platforms as well. We need to think about how we can enable users to have experiences in one brand on a different platform and vice versa. Um, again, there could be um, people who are friends who have different devices, who access different platforms, who have different preferences for which types of platforms they want to use. We still want them to be able to connect and play together. So what are the ways that we can do that? And then um, lastly, um, you know, being able to even just translate um, our transfer, our digital identity across those different experiences. Um, just something as simple as being able to have the same avatar that you can use across these different platforms, um, retaining user preferences, your NFT collection, your cryptocurrency wallet. This needs to feel like a very seamless transition across these different platforms. Otherwise, you're going to really limit the user base um, very quickly. But um, as Matt mentioned, we're definitely not quite here yet. We still have several very walled garden ecosystems. And so we advise that you just need to be ready to prepare for a messy ecosystem. And then really just think about where are your users today? Um, standardization, as Matt said, is really difficult to enforce at the minute. So rather than fight that, the key is to actually just understand what your users preferred devices and platforms are and design for those. Um, we can also think about um, if you want to um, plan for wider accessibility, um, take the time to actually develop different um, instantiations of your experience across these different platforms, um, make lighter versions so that people with lower end devices can also experience them as well. Um, and lastly, think about how you can utilize the third party aggregator platforms um, so that you don't have to do a lot of that work uh, yourself um, and your user base can be um, can access that um, through those third party aggregators. Um, as we said, you know, think about where your users are today. And that's something that you can actually just partner with your market um, insights team to think about sizing and prioritizing these market entry points and selecting the good entry um, for you so that you can get your, your users um, uh, using your experience or your products today. Um, and then lastly, um, we need to be realistic, as Matt said. This vision for the metaverse is super exciting, um, but as I said, we're just not quite there yet. Um, until we get there, just make sure that your vision is in line with the current capabilities. There are a lot of limitations in today's hardware and software. Firstly, um, the hardware is expensive and it's getting more expensive, has limited battery life, the headsets are uncomfortable and can cause motion sickness, which limits the amount of long-term use that they wanna do. Um, the experiences are also need a lot of bandwidth. I don't know whether anyone tried to log into the Metaverse Fashion Week hosted on Decentraland earlier this year, but you know it requires lots of heavy duty graphics cards to actually make it work, which meant that a lot of people just couldn't actually access it even on a laptop. Um, so that's something that is, is a limiting factor as well. And in the back end as well, there's also um, issues about um, getting people to be able to move the transfer between these different walled garden experiences. Um, you know, the onboarding and logging processes um, are really complex as it is, and they are even harder to work when um, you're trying to do them in virtual reality or augmented reality. Um, and then similarly to trying to think about getting people to, to create these new experiences, the software to create the content is just very complex. It is not an easy thing, just like taking a picture on your phone and uploading it to a platform. It requires a lot of um, complex backend software and rendering capabilities to, to create this stuff. So these are some issues that, that limit the amount of 
um, content that and accessibility to these experiences that we have today. Um, but you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, what we can do is um, think about focusing on perfecting the simple stuff today. Um, so that we are ready to um, take advantage of these amazing new um, paradigm shifting technologies as they become more mature in the future. So today, um, it's about really making today's low fidelity experience great. Um, so as I said, it's not just about virtual reality, really think about how you can support these immersive experiences um, to be accessed via a laptop, via a phone, via a tablet, um, to enable the widest um, experience, uh, um, widest access to the experience you want to create. Um, once you've managed to get people using it, um, lag is a real turnoff. People will leave this experience if it's glitchy. Um, and so really focus on just minimizing lag to ensure the experience is synced and that the um, users can really feel as immersed as possible. And then, you know, just make your onboarding and navigation as simple as intuitive as possible. Um, we're going to have people hopping through these different walled gardens. And so just make it super easy for people just to start up that experience. And then as we think about tomorrow, once we have this solid foundation, that's how you can build those layers of immersion and interactivity on top of that. Um, once you've started with the with the simple experience, think about how you could make it augmented reality. Think about how you could make it a full virtual reality experience. Um, and then most importantly, think about how you can develop these experiences and assets to be portable across other platforms. You don't have to be the technology developer yourself. How can you piggyback on these, these other platforms that are going to be um, refined over the next few years? Um, but then, you know, it's not just about designing for the future. It's also about you know, thinking about the laggards of your users as well. How can you make sure that you have backwards compatibility? Because not everyone's going to be using the most advanced headset. Um, and so we really just need to think about all of the different contexts, all of the different devices, all of the different platforms that users are going to want um, in order to give them access to your experience. Um, and that's how we can think about building this really um, beautiful vision for this seamlessly connected metaverse that everyone can be a part of. Um, and so here is just a quick summary slide, um, uh, which, which goes um, pulls some details from all of these different principles. Um, that's the end of our presentation. And we are now open for questions, um, if anyone has any. Since we've um, spent so much time uh, going through our, our presentation, I think we'll actually hold the questions um, for email. So everyone who did submit questions for email, we will follow up with those um, in, in email form. Uh, thank you very much for the attendance. Uh, I hope this was useful and interesting. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for us to have the chance to share our thoughts about uh, designing for next generation experiences. Um, and. We welcome any sorts of, of direct follow up or additional questions that you may have for us uh, post webinar. So thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.